Um, one is that I've always actually gone to the trouble with the other lecturers to check first on vital things like the dates of the title of the book, just in case on the spur of the moment um, my memory failed me or I went into momentary panic. Um, but it's the nature of the AA that one discovers that one knows nothing whatsoever about one's colleagues. And what I know about Mark is I've been to some of his lectures on Friday mornings and enjoyed them enormously, and I've had conversations with him, which I've enjoyed enormously or not, depending on the conversation. Um, but actually, I, I know nothing about his background. And, and um, I asked Mark just now what he wanted me to say. He said, why don't you say just that? Because that tells you all kinds of things about the AA. Um, what I do know is we asked him to contribute to this course because of his views, um, in part uh, critical, I think, of a kind of what he might, I think, maintain as a mainline dogmatism, which despite, I thought, a Catholic choice of lecturers, he might see as quite narrow and align it in a particular kind of uh, philosophical position. Uh, we were talking earlier about uh, the kind of curious way in which scientific positions um, are identified by the general public. The strange thing is that uh, Darwin is seen as the, uh, the good guy, the public hero, the genius, and Lamarck is seen as the dreadful man who fudged the books and believed in heritage and inherit in, 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 in characteristics. But as we were discussing earlier, in fact, the truth is that Darwin also uh, believed in inherited characteristics, even possibly more so uh, than Lamarck. And as you read through from the first edition of Origin of the Species to the sixth edition, he strengthens the position rather than uh, weakening it. Um, if, if you've never read one edition of The Origin of the Species, it is the most wonderful read. And if you read one, then do enjoy reading another. First read the first edition, and then the sixth, or alternatively the sixth and then the first. But it's the most extraordinary way of watching a man maneuver to adapt his theory to um, uh, changing political uh, comment and, and social acceptance. You'll gather I'm flanneling like mad as the last few people walked into the room. Um, it gives me enormous pressure to introduce Mark, who's going to address frontally the, the suggestion that, in fact, there is a possible mechanism for the inheritance of characteristics other than through genetic information. Mark. OK. Um, this lecture is, is um, something of a a wager <coughs> uh, as to see whether um, an outline which I'm going to make of ideas of the inheritance of acquired characteristics, largely done through um, an exposition and commentary on certain ideas of Freud, to see whether or not there's a, a kind of crossover ground in terms of contemporary debates um, about morphology and inheritance. Let's just rehearse a few totally well-known historical facts. Um, it was of the nature of 19th century knowledge that once biology had established itself through the form of natural selection, that people, starting with Huxley, uh, began to consider the possibility that the mechanism of natural selection would be able to explain the morphological characteristics of cultures and, to some extent, the morphological characteristics of individuals. So in a sense, one of the reasons why the 19th century was very interested in, at the level of uh, the individual, the question on the one hand of genius um, and on the other hand of idiocy uh, is precisely the possibility of proposing the idea uh, that it was natural selection which determined these characteristics at the level of societies, there was a notion not only that there was an evolutionary chain in a teleological sense, which actually is no part of Darwin's theory, uh, but which simply, uh, almost through a mistake, became characteristic of social theories which based themselves on Darwin, but that there were 
kind of social mechanisms equivalent to the mechanisms of natural selection through which societies uh, or cultures selected characteristics which would survive. Now, in a sense, this uh, Darwinianism, as it was applied both to the level of the individual and applied at the level of the culture, began by the turn of the century to gain a rather bad press. Um, one might say that at the beginning of the 20th century, the rise of American anthropology, which completely opposed the notion of evolution, and as it were, set all cultures at par. And also at the level of human personality, um, the forms that the, the, the major forms of analysis of personality moved away from the notion of natural selection. And the notion of natural selection fell into a kind of disuse. Really, I suppose, until about the 1970s, when equipped with a modern theory of genetics, there was a return into the human sciences of genetics um, as an attempt to explain characteristics which govern both individual lives on the one hand and cultural lives on the other hand. Uh, this is frequently associated initially with the work of E.O. Wilson uh, and the work of sociobiology. The suggestion that there was a genetic, not only a genetic basis, but in some sense a genetic determination of individual behavior and also of the forms which culture took was immediately and heatedly rejected by a broad swathe of the human sciences. If you want to look uh, at a text which in the 70s represented a considered reply from the human sciences, uh, one might think of the work of the anthropologist Marshall Salins uh, in the book, The Use and Abuse of Biology. In broad outline, the argument put forward um, by Salins was that the sheer variation of human cultures and the sheer variation of individual behavior would always, to put it, uh, in its most modest form, would always radically be underdetermined by a genetic basis. So one of the favorite examples given by anthropologists is really concerned with the nature of kinship. A number of sociobiologists rashly rushed to the idea that the family had a kind of genetic basis but the family they were talking about was very much the American nuclear family. And as it were, they needed to be reminded that the study of kinship includes an extraordinarily wide uh, variation of forms of kinship. The extent of which variation is so great that to talk about the family, and there were other topics which crucially came up in these arguments, the question of altruism, the question of sexuality, uh, and another of other such issues which were thought that it was possible by sociobiologists that they were genetically controlled, produced a kind of backlash from within the human sciences, uh, a backlash which is still not open. Uh, I see in the newspaper this morning um, that there is uh, an argument as to whether or not crime might have a genetic basis. Even a relatively conservative figure in the social sciences like Sir Michael Rutter from the Institute of Psychiatry uh, 
says it is in principle impossible that there be a gene for crime. The argument here being that, as it were, whatever it is that a gene might determine, it could not determine something as a crime which is absolutely a social artifact, a social product. If you think, for example, of the idea of killing somebody, there are so many different social circumstances under which you might be driven to kill someone, some of which are socially approved and you get the VC, and some of which are condemned and you go to prison for the rest of your life. That is to say, there is no isomorphic relationship between what a gene could determine and a social fact. Because a social fact is always constructed in and by social forces. So we have a situation rumbling around um, for 20 years in which, on the one hand, um, there are sociobiologists whose account, in some sense, of social relations they would wish to put on the side of genetic determination. And those social scientists who take not only considerable pride in denying that, which seems to me reasonable, but as it were, uh, you can get to the position in sociology departments where almost any mention of the term gene is politically suspect. Uh, I mean, you must be a sort of crypto-Nazi uh, for even considering the issue of genetics. Uh, and this has produced in the human sciences, in sociology and anthropology, a lamentable indifference um, and a foolish ignorance uh, of modern contemporary developments in the most sort of exciting area of research. It's one of those uh, situations within knowledge um, which is much to be lamented in which out of a political and social conviction that society and individual life is determined by society and individual life rather than by genetics has led to a kind of wholesale embracing of ignorance of contemporary biology. That's one problem that we face. I mean, in a sense, I have nothing to say about it except to um, lament that condition. Now, the second issue, that, the second point I want to make, really is concerned with the question of inheritance. Because there is no way in which someone in the human sciences can adequately abandon the notion of inheritance. And yet, as it were, together with the rejection of genetics, there has been a tendency to reject um, the notion of inheritance as such. For many sociologists, many sociologists are guilty of what I would call sociologism. That is, a view of the individual which really goes back to the 17th century, the idea of the individual as simply a tabula rasa, a slate upon which social relations are inscribed. Now, not only do I think this is theoretically wrong, I think despite sociology's love of being thought to be a radical, uh, a radical discipline, <coughs> it's one of the reasons why those ideas have actually themselves been in the service of some of the most totalitarian ideologies that have existed in the 20th century the idea that you can create de novo a kind of new man or a new woman as an automatic effect of reformed or revolutionized social practices. 
At that level, Bolshevism is a good example. Its conception was simply that the personality structure and that the forms of culture would simply yield to a new type of society. Given a new economic base, given a new superstructure of politics and ideology, the human animal would simply transform itself in accordance with the laws. The extreme case of this, and I use it simply because it illustrates, as it were, the totalitarian fantasy of the malleability of human material, comes in the Bolshevik linguist Ma. Now, Ma was a linguist who belonged to the Bolshevik party uh, and whose work essentially consisted of saying that languages themselves were the effect simply of conflictual social relations. You may think that he had a rather uphill task. His task was to demonstrate that proletarian languages resembled each other more than bourgeois languages. He actually set himself the task of demonstrating, for example, that middle class English and French had more in common uh, than what also had in, uh, characteristics in common, proletarian French and proletarian English. As a consequence, since language for Ma was actually an effect of the class struggle. He actually believed um, that in a communist society, language, like the state, like politics, like the law, would wither away. No one would need to speak because all reality would be transparent to everybody. And in a sense, there would simply be one harmonious organism of telepathy. <coughs> Uh, no, because it's not, it's, it's intranet. It's not internet. It's not a communication between people. Uh, it's the construction, as it were, of a superordinate type of personality. Um, you know, variously called communism, uh, or more traditionally called the mind of God. So we have, as it were, the difficulty of thinking about a situation in the human sciences which on the one hand regards human behavior and the morphology of human institutions as determined genetically, and the opposite view, what we might call a sociologism or an anthropologism which is based on the idea that societies reproduce themselves like by auto effect upon the human material uh, which make up their members. Now, needless to say, um, I disagree with, with both views. One of the issues which situates Freud in an extremely difficult space of knowledge, as it were, um, is his, what was thought, what used to be thought to be his lamentable Lamarckism. Um, his peculiar and enduring affection for the idea that it was possible for acquired characteristics to be inherited. Now, as it were with the development of genetics, um, this view decreasingly found any scientific favor. Indeed, you know, children and undergraduates used to be taught that the final consequence of the errors of Lamarckism were to be found in the Soviet Union's policy on winter wheat. Uh, where, as it were, um, the Soviet Union, in its voluntarism uh, about the nature of characteristics, believed 
that if you could produce a germ of wheat which would survive for one winter, it would somehow learn how to survive the second winter. As you can imagine, uh, the result was failed harvests uh, and the cessation of the idea uh, that Siberia was going to be a great cornfield. That was the way in which it used to be presented. That was the, the final outcome of the folly of believing in acquired, the inheritance of acquired characteristics. Now, it may well be that John is going to say that actually, these days, uh, geneticists are in some sense turning back to the possibility of the inheritance of acquired characteristics. I want to really, in the rest of the talk, to isolate one mechanism through which Freud thought that you could inherit acquired characteristics. Let's think for a moment of all those early 20th century studies, or late 19th century studies, on the inheritance of genius. Now, they no longer strike us as being terribly interesting, still less as being scientific. The notion being, as a kind of fundamental theoretical prejudice, that if you could show a line, like a family line of geniuses, of which I suppose, obviously, the Darwin family uh, would be paramount within that, the answer to this inheritance must be, in some sense, genetic. How else would certain characteristics be, certain acquired characteristics, how else would they be inherited? And this is the point where I wish to introduce Freud. Before I can do so, one has to give some sketch of Freud's revolutionary notion of the human personality. The traditional Christian view of the personality is that somehow you are born with a soul. Not just a soul, but with a particular kind of a soul. In the 19th century, this began to be kind of treated in a more secular form. Uh, and becomes something like a personality. But essentially, you have a personality. It's to be thought of in very much from the mid-19th century onwards in a certain uh, kind of topological way in accordance with biology in terms of there being an endogenous zone of personality and a kind of exogenous zone, which you might call the environment. So that somehow your personality was an effect of those internal relations, those internal potentialities, as they come into conflict, agreement, compromise, whatever, with external reality or the environment. So you are, insofar as you are yourself, you are an effect of the historic compromise between what you might have been and what you became in terms of your relation to the environment. It's, it's very much in terms of uh, a relationship between an in, internal set of relations and an external set of um, pressures. Now, Freud takes a radically different view of human personality. Perhaps the only contact with traditional conceptions of personality is that Freud certainly thought everybody was unique. But the uniqueness was put on a very different basis from the way it had ever been argued before. 
Freud thought, Freud describes the ego, that is the conscious system of your life, of being the graveyard, what he calls the graveyard of your previous identifications. And it's this word identification that I want to look at for a moment. That is to say, you do not start, nor indeed do you end, as yourself. In so far as you are yourself, either unconsciously or at the level of the ego, you are an effect of the identifications with others that you have made. You're unique because no one else has that heritage, that system of identifications. But in a sense, you're not unique in the sense that you're made up. You're a kind of one possible fictional outcome of the way in which you've related to others. Now, one important point to notice here is that Freud's thought completely transforms the notion of the identity of a person. Many theories of what a person is, and indeed perhaps our most private and convinced thoughts, are that what we are is what I feel to be inside myself. It, it's, it's as if there is a, a, a fundamental property of the personality in that I think what I am is what I am inside. Insofar as we're permanently misunderstood by other people, we're always trying to represent what we really are. I'm sorry you completely misunderstand me. We tend to forgive ourselves some of our most appalling behavior by saying, I'm very sorry, I was acting quite out of character. Uh, when of course, actually, unfortunately, that might be our most obvious characteristics to the rest of the world. What Freud does, in, in a sense, is to transform the idea of the inside and the outside. So that we come to the paradoxical proposition, paradoxical hypothesis, that what I feel myself to be inside is the effect of a set of identifications which I've made with the outside. Let me give you kind of like an absurd uh, example. Some of these paradoxes are coded in language. You go into a dress shop. Um, quite frequently, what's very close to our body is very close to questions of identification. You hold up a dress, and you say to your companion who's come with you, do you think this is me? holding up the dress. Now, it's an extremely, it's always struck me, it's an extremely odd question. Uh, now, doubtless an Oxford philosopher would say, no, it's not you, it's a dress. Uh, but I don't think that that kind of takes the issue very far. What's going on here is, as it were, someone saying, can I identify myself as being the bearer of this dress such that it returns in a mysterious way to seem to express me. Now, of course, it is of the nature of the design and the etiquette of clothes, shop, clothes shops to convince you that that is really you. Um, so shop assistants are trained to walk casually past saying, that's really you. Um, to be subjected, as it were, to be subjected to the process of becoming a subject, that is, having an identity. Now, this absurd example, which I also think is an extremely serious example, is one which we can always spot in other people, but we can never spot in ourselves. You know, you hear someone else saying, as a mother of 10 and a Catholic, I feel. Now, 
Their conviction is that they are speaking on behalf of themselves. Internally, it is their innermost truth. If you are not a Catholic and you're not a mother of ten, whatever, if you're not Victoria Gillick, um, you will understand immediately as you begin to criticize them that what they are is someone who has identified very strongly with external positions, but the process of identification turns the conviction. It's not just, I support this group. I support that church. It is, that church is me. This introduces a fundamental paradox about identity. At the level of consciousness, identity is experienced as what is in me, what is internal to me, what is most true, what is essential, what is least to do with the outside world, but of course has been built up <coughs> through a whole process of identification. Right? So now we can begin to raise the question of inheritance. Freud gives a good example. Um, of the inheritance by certain patients of a cough. Right? Uh, he treats someone very famously, um, a spirited and intelligent woman whose known history as Dora, uh, but only treated her um, for a few weeks because he made a fatal mistake um, in his analysis of her, uh, and she abandoned him forevermore. Now, she had a cough, and Freud's analysis of that cough is really about the mechanism of the inheritance of an acquired characteristic. The analysis is complex, and it goes something like this. Unconsciously, she loved her father. Now, I can't and I don't want to this afternoon uh, go into a whole account of Freud's account of sexuality uh, and of incestuous love, but it's the presupposition for this argument. Insofar as she loved unconsciously her father, she identified with her mother, who had a cough. That is to say, she inherits her cough so that at the level of unconscious fantasy, she can unconsciously convince herself, I am you, and therefore I should have him. Insofar as the cough symbolizes or signifies that I am you, I am in your position. This cough was complicated by the fact also that she had another cough. And this second cough relates to the fact that her father had a cough. <laughs> Freud's analysis, as it were, of this second cough, right, is that the question here is not a question of identification with my mother so I can have my father. It's of straight identification with my father. It's, in a sense, more primitive, more regressed. Since I love him, I identify with him, whatever he does, I do. In order to unconsciously, and I keep wanting to stress the issue of the unconscious here, insofar as he has a cough, I have a cough. Now, in case you think this is just wildly implausible, imagine as I'm sure you've all seen, people gathered around the cot of a newborn infant. Even after a week, you will see parents and family already providing the infant with things to identify with. Not only just issues where the baby will come to identify with certain things, but a kind of adult preparation 
for that process. And you will hear things like, he's got his father's smile. I mean, strangers always go, oh, he certainly has. I mean, it looks nothing like it. The funny thing is, it may look nothing like it now, but if they keep saying it, it will do later on, or he'll have a specific scowl, which is the opposite of his father's smile, which really comes to the same thing. It's governed by an identificatory process, or in a sense, a disidentificatory process, through which the unconscious is able to support uh, a whole structure, which we can call a structure of character, or consciousness, or ego. There's a third mechanism, which doesn't necessarily involve, for Freud's analysis, the question of a kiss. It's the identification with other people, so it's a bit like the first one, so that you can have what they have. He gives the example of um, a tale in Vienna <coughs> of uh, a girl in boarding school who receives a letter from her boyfriend breaking off their love affair, she bursts into tears, and all her female companions also burst into tears. Because the unconscious process is that by bursting into tears, they too unconsciously have suffered the end of a love affair, therefore they must have had a love affair in the first place. Um, and clearly those kind of identificatory processes which frequently break out in ad any adolescent society. It often leads to mass fainting. I mean, they're quite dramatic effects. Uh, is based on the notion of identification. So for Freud, who we are is a immensely complex history of the identifications, and I would also want to add the disidentification that people make unconsciously. I mean, I want to stress, this is not an attribute of conscious life. Conscious life has very little effect upon us. I mean, I, you know, I might consciously think that's nice, I'll try and do it for a few minutes, but it'll sort of wear off. It's only where there's an image where there is an unconscious pressure to identify. So at that level, at an individual level, at the level of individual development, we can say that the human personality is a unique system of inheritance of acquired characteristics picked up in the first instance probably from parents, from siblings, and then more generally uh, from the world, but that will always have a weaker force. They are this system of identifications, which means that the inheritance of characteristics is a very real process in the development of individual life. I've just got time to turn to the identificatory processes, which exist not just at the level of the individual, but at the level of um, groups. It's clear uh, that group behavior clearly differs from individual behavior. The moment I fall under the sway of a group, I am in the grip of a more powerful <coughs> unconscious force than when I'm sitting by myself at home, a reasonably sort of complex entity. One of the important features, Freud argues, of belonging or falling into belonging to a group is that it radically simplifies and makes more primitive your psychological life. Put another way, it means you regress to an earlier stage of development. In a sense, uh, this is quite obvious uh, and well documented. A crowd, once you belong to a crowd, 
a crowd is not just a collection of people. It is, as it were, a morphological entity with its own psychic economy. As such, it's more primitive than an individual because the individual is always more complex. It's regressed. It's simplified. It's more open to naked emotional sway, partly because many of the restraints which operate upon us as individuals are suspended once we belong to a group. And in a sense, the stronger the group, the more we lose the constraints which operators operate upon us as individuals. Clearly, one of the characteristics of a crowd is that it can abandon its conscience, or rather, individuals will allow their conscience to, to be suspended while they operate under the pressure of a group. Now, for Freud, this notion of a group is one which inherits certain features from our infantile life. It always involves for him the structure of an identification with some fundamental family setting. Uh, this is why, as it were, so many strong institutions like churches precisely use the language of the family in order to underscore uh, the true nature of the ties which bind people. There is, you know, God the Father, we are brothers in Christ, sisters in Christ. It, it precisely utilizes the vocabulary which is reawoken. Now, one of the features of the group is that in this primitive acting out of infantile behavior, it's why all groups in that sense are infantile, Intellectual activity is by and large suspended in favor of emotional energy. The notion of a group is one which will always wish to make itself coherent, to make itself unified. This constitutes one of the dangers of very strong groups in that in order to do that, in order to bind the group, through the ties of mutual identification, right? In order to bind people through the ties of mutual identification, I must project everything that, as an individual, I can tolerate as ambivalence. I'm like this, but also I'm like that. That can't be tolerated in a group. It has to be projected outwards. Outwards in a way which means that very strong religions will always find their enemies. Not only will they find external enemies, but when there's any threat to their cohesion, they will start finding internal enemies as well. So there is a certain, what Freud would call, libidinal structure to the group, which actually utilizes, quite unconsciously, certain characteristics which we inherited as children and which have been reawoken. Anyone who's ever been in an institution that passes through a particularly kind of crisis-ridden patch uh, will readily assent, although they may well have belonged to it, to the infantile character of the way in which intellectual activity is suspended in favor of emotional force. Now, what I've tried to suggest in this lecture is that Freud takes up the question of inheritance in a very important way. I don't have time this afternoon, but it would be possible to say that perhaps the decisive characteristic of Freud's contribution is to be able to answer the question of how human personality is able to be conceived of as a set of inheritances 
without channeling that notion of inheritance through anything like genetic inheritance on the one hand, or on the other hand, conceiving of the human personality as an empty vessel which simply is inscribed upon uh, by social relations. Let me kind of end with kind of one suggestion. Um, it's about the way in which the Freudian way uh, of thinking might reanimate the notion of a tradition. I suppose to the geneticist, if a human activity repeats itself, then in some sense it might well be thought to be genetically coded for that repetition. And therefore, there isn't a theoretical question of tradition as such. There are just enduring genetically coded characteristics. If we turn on the other side and look at the way in which sociology and anthropology conceive of tradition, we can see that they always place the idea of tradition on the side of the conservative repetition through relations of power of a certain dogma or a certain practice, a certain form of life. That's why they're usually against tradition. It's thought to be a sort of dull repetition. It, it, it lies on the side of the conservative. Now, I thought about this first when reading, I think, quite the worst art history book I've ever looked at, uh, which is Ariana Stasinopoulos's completely daft but huge study of Picasso, uh, in which the argument went something like this. By the time the poor old duffer was about 60, uh, he'd run out of invention. Um, and he turned to the feeble reworking of traditional images from art history. Uh, in particular, he was so starved of invention uh, that he started redoing Velasquez's Las Meninas. Now, anyone who's looked at these quite extraordinary pictures will, I think, form quite a different impression of what is meant by a tradition. This is not a case of Picasso identifying with Velasquez, or if there is an identification, it is of a profoundly rivalrous identification, which of course is true of any identification. One of the important points about tradition is when I identify with something, I not only want to do what it is, but I also, at some level, want to displace it. Freud remarks time and time again that the origins of identification lie in cannibalism. I like you so much uh, that I'm going to eat you. In order you know, that it's a fundamentally oral mode of consumption. It is not admiration as an identification. It's almost a kind of settling accounts with Velasquez. As a consequence, I mean, a kind of rival. As a consequence, Picasso not only places himself in a tradition of painting, which regards Velasquez as a master, but seeks to supersede Velasquez. But as a consequence, also reanimates Velasquez, quite unintentionally. In the, to put it very sort of um, dramatically, as part of the wish to kill Velasquez off, he gives him a new lease of life. In a sense, that's one model um, of the question of tradition as a set of identifications which aren't concerned with passive obedience to an image or to a model, but which play out 
the true, what for Freud was always of greatest account, is that of rivalry, where one's admiration and one's hatred <coughs> of an object are very close together. And that always informs the process of identification. One must imagine, for example, by extension, that those families which have been studied for why on earth they produced 10 generations of violinists is precisely in that mode of ambivalent identification. On the one hand, I want to be you and play the violin, but I want to play it better and kill you off as the original image. So as it were, identification here is not just a passive activity of borrowing from the external or from the prior world. It's also an active and aggressive relationship to it. In the sense then that insofar, the reason why I took the example of tradition is precisely that tradition is a form of the inheritance of acquired characteristics. And I think in a cultural sense, it is now quite possible to give an account of tradition which is completely non-traditionalist. I think I'd better stop there. that they're not conceived on the model of a gene. I mean, you know, the, the one thing that I would want, well, this indeed is the question. Um, I do not think that the mechanism that the gene represents, or the mechanism of its inheritance, is the same as the kind of inheritance that I'm talking about uh, you know, put that the other way around, genes do not operate through identification. Right? Uh, so I think the answer is no. I mean, my answer uh, is no. Um, and I think Dawkins has often been, how can I put it, tempted to engage in a kind of biological imperialism in respect to problems of the human sciences, right, which simply kind of logically won't work. One of the problems, however, here is that a number of arguments about genetic inheritance have nothing to do with, in a sense, a uh, scholarly concern with genes. Arguments about genes also enter the culture and therefore also enter the arena uh, of political debate in a very kind of unstable way. I mean, let me, let, me, let me just give a few examples. One of the original attempts to decriminalize homosexuality, which was initiated in the German Social Democrat Party uh, by the late 1880s, based itself in a way which was still true in the 1920s in the work of Magnus Hirschfeld, on the fact that since homosexuality was a biologically conditioned state, it was therefore irrational and illogical to punish it. Right? So, um, you know, people always pay attention to right-wing uses of the idea of genetic determination, 
actually, there's a whole history also of left-wing uses of genetic uh, um, ascription. And indeed, this is recently, the reason why I mention it, it's recently we found favor, this theory, uh, in the USA. I have no doubt uh, that there can't possibly be a genetic explanation for homosexuality because homosexuality is a discursively constructed <coughs> activity. That is to say, it's not, it's not in philosophical sense um, a given form of behavior. I, mean, I think almost the sole thing you could say about sexuality uh, is that it is the source of a certain psychical energy. Right? Um, the idea that, you, that, that things like homosexuality or indeed heterosexuality could be genetically coded seems to me ridiculous. These are psychical states, however, which can be psychologically inherited or inherited as a consequence of a certain psychical position within the identificatory processes of the, the young child. Right? So on the one hand, um, I'm strongly resistant to the idea of taking the model of genetic inheritance to explain phenomena which simply will always be by necessity radically underdetermined by genetics. I'm as against that as I am the kind of sociologism which simply says you know, you're the effect of the culture. That is equally uh, um, a kind of gross um, position. It assumes that there is like an unproblematic relationship between a culture and a set of behavior. I mean, it relies on the completely false notion, I think, of conditioning. If you want to find out where this is, I mean, it's those arguments which say, you know, pornography, subjection of someone to pornography will turn them into you know, some kind of sexual criminal through the idea of conditioning. Conditioning on the one hand and genetic inheritance on the other in terms of both individual behavior and cultural forms, both of them seem to me to radically miss the importance of the question that that behavior, or indeed sometimes those cultural forms, are the effect of complex individual histories and complex cultural mechanisms of identification. So what I'm trying to kind of install here, in a way, is this concept of identification as the, the, the category between the two extremes of causal explanation for individual and cultural behavior. Any other questions? Okay, let's go and have a drink. Can I thank Mark very much? That was a marvellous talk, Mark, and thank you very much. That was great. Oh, sorry, I didn't even get into it, actually. Yeah, I mean, I, I would, this, this question is...
intelligent enough to understand and appreciate the gesture. I confidently expect that such a building will have been, will have designed and constructed itself in response to the needs of its users and acting in harmony with its environment. It will be self-sustaining, it will exhibit metabolism, it will derive order from its environment and be controlled by a symbiotic relationship with its inhabitants and that environment. And when it's outlived its usefulness, it will self-destruct and redistribute its resources. This lecture is to that first building in the hope that it won't be too long. What I have to do first, though, is a little recapitulation. I'm going to spend a few minutes at the beginning and show slides, I'm afraid some of you may have seen before, but in a very much abbreviated form. And I'm going to try and explain some of the sources uh, of information we're using, because I feel that we haven't been specific enough about where these ideas have been derived from. I want to get that balance right. And I want to touch on each of the other speakers as I get past. The sources of apprentice at the beginning, the sources of apprentice is the name for one of the computer models that we developed quite later on in this sequence, whose significance I will try to remember to return to, but it doesn't escape me in the heat of the moment. And Yasha Reichardt uh, gave a timely warning with her delightful talk about um, Frankenstein, uh, about the problems of, of our dealing with technology. And he was fear of this. And that we do not know what we're doing. We were stepping into the unknown, and I think a timely warning. And Margaret Bowden talked about creativity. And one of the things that's very obvious, or I hope what I'm saying, is that we're trying to shift um, the, the role and the, and, the, and the position of creativity. Um, clearly, we're not expecting people to operate, or architects to operate in the normal manner. They're being asked if they follow the kind of, sort of program that we're proposing. Two, concentrate on that vital first generic step. Now, I actually don't believe this is so odd. I think most architects work that way. It's a generating concept, a generic idea, which informs all their ideas, which they then mutate and develop for particular sites and situations. So I don't believe in that sense I'm, I'm proposing anything uh, particularly odd. What is slightly unusual is propose that it should then be Cubes are a nuisance. They have 26 neighbors of four, uh, three different sorts edge neighbors, face neighbors, vertex neighbors. 26 neighbors is far too many to talk to. In the fact, they're all different as a pain. Um, spheres, close packed, have 12 neighbors, which is a nice, elegant number. They're all equidistant. So they're isospatial, isotropic, isomorphic, isometric, equal measure, equal dimension, equal, equal kind, equal orientation. Doesn't matter. So we have a, a homogeneous spatial model, isospatial model. And as it happens, and this is, this is entirely coincidence, that my original seed from 30 years ago, which was my starting point on the left, actually has the same geometrical configuration as the seed on the right, which is the one-stage expansion of that close packing structure. Uh, it's coincidence, but it's not. I'll worry about that later. And uh, I want to talk about this, though, instead, which is faults. Um, everybody always assumes that when you look at these things, everything is already known. It's just not the case. Simply as simple as piling ball bearings together, there is more to be seen. In this case, Nicola Lefebvre discovered that if you produce a fault, on the left, a close packing ball bearing. On the right, there's a next layer which has, you can see, I'm sure, a shadow line across it, a dislocation in the system. You pile the next level on top, and on the left, magically, the fault disappears. It corrects itself. And on the right, it reappears. There is self-replicating information in a physical, natural system, not in an electronic system. Here you can see it in a computer model. You can model exactly how these faults replicate each other, and in three, oh, this is a casting of it, and I've shown this many times before. Um, I mention this simply because I like the idea that the thing on the right is my ancestor. Um, we, the, the idea that the fundamental information inside us is nothing more than the replication of faults in clay, I find a nice humbling notion. And Karen Smith, um, who's mentioned um, in Dawkins' book, he talks about the idea of replication in mineral systems as being the only thing. The question is, how did DNA evolve? I mean, we, know, we understand that. But there's so many of these unanswered questions. And here is one potential. On the right there is an evolving three-dimensional fault line model where the fault starts to replicate and gains in consistency as it replicates. There is one possible model. And again, uh, there is discussion about giving this notion back into the natural sciences and to say, look, here is a model by which at least we don't have to say that this is the origin of life. We don't have to say this is how DNA evolved. All we have to say is, look, 
We have a model of something which actually evolves and replicates its own faults, and it's nothing more than, 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 a, than a set of packing spheres. It's so simple. Now I move to the conceptual model of this. This is the model um, constructed by Manit Rastogi with uh, Thomas Kujan at the end of last year, particularly Manit, um, which is a compilation of all the thinking of the unit. On the left, you see the little pile of spheres. There are white ones which are environment and blue ones which are structure. They're being driven at the top by two cellular automata. The 2D cellular automata are driving the rules of the 3D cellular automata. And between the structure and environment, it is negotiating a surface, which is the yellow, uh, the yellow surface that you can see uh, developing. Um, so the negotiations over the development of the surface are entirely to do with the negotiation between these cells, which are multi-state cellular systems. Now, I, I got at some point to come clean about something. <laughs> Maybe I'll do it now. Uh, in all these cases, what I've always said is that the architect embodies his generic concept in a genetic language to make a seed which is then developed in these computer programs by modeling the development of that thing inside an environment, and that uh, is how his architectural concept is going to develop. Now that <coughs> gives the architect a very strong role in one sense, and gives the client and user a very strong, the environment a very strong role in another sense. I like that change, but the temptation was that wasn't enough. I mean, if you happen to be religious, then you don't have a problem over this. I'm not, so I cannot attribute uh, the forms I see in front of me in this room to some uh, deity. Therefore, I have a problem. So I thought, well, I have to be able to do the architectural equivalent, which is to evolve these things out of a primeval soup. And what I'm, <laughs> what I'm gonna say is that my own, what I've been doing over the last few years, quietly in the background, is trying to get these models to run with no seed and no rules, no input. All I do as the architect is to set up the situation I set up a situation in which it might happen and then see if the whole thing cannot evolve itself. And increasingly, some of the models you're seeing, you'll find there's increasingly a hands-off tendency as gradually you begin to realize that these things are capable of learning and developing their own rules, their own emergent properties, their own internal conceptual behaviors, their own internal architectures. So just as you thought I'd given you this role of immortality, I take it away. Instead, I offer an option of, of deification by creating an environment in which a whole new experience might happen. These are slides explaining the um, uh, model which is currently running on the internet. And anyone in the room who's tried to log in and had difficulty, I apologize. We've had all kinds of problems. I'm sure if you were there at the Big Bang, there were a few hitches, and they said, hang on a minute, hang on, we can't do it quite yet. Um, and, and, and a little bit of a problem. So, uh, Th we have had some difficulties, but it is now running, or I'm we're sure for the third or fourth time that it's now running. These are diagrams of the system. The, the, the model was primarily built by Manat Astogi in collaboration with um, Peter Graham, to a certain extent from Ulster, and um, uh, um, Patrick Janssen. Patrick did the diagrams on the left explaining this. Um, this is... Fundamentally, that describes the whole thing. In the middle is a chromosome pool of genes coming in from all over the world. By cellular division and developing, it develops these into systems which are then tested in an environment and are more or less successful, as a result of which it is more or less probable that the genes in that dominant chromosome pool might or might not get picked again. On the left, you can see the elements of the model. The far, far right of the, of the, sorry, on the right, the far right of the right is the cellular structure growing. The bottom left is a, a, is a map of the search space, and in the, on the top left is the, what they call the materialization, or I would call visualization. So here you see it step by step. Here you see the elements of cellular growth as this thing develops and, in, and, um, and, it, and, and develops a cellular structure. And on the right, you can see that growing. Here you see the problem of genetic search space. Where are you looking? How do we know where we're looking for? And increasingly, there, there is thinking coming out of some of the students in the unit um, about the idea in which there are sort of strange attractors in this space, uh, which will make some things more or less likely to be um, successful and productive areas. 
and then materialization by going through this position structure of, of cellular division and, and, and mapping. Now, that's how the central chromosomal algorithm works. It's simply a description of the processes. Almost all these processes require everything I've mentioned this evening. They rely on the cellular automata, the genetic algorithms, the mapping, the coding, the whole thing, and more. This is just an overview of all the little bits in the jigsaw and how they come together. Um, what I think I'd like to do is ask, um, what, what do you think you could manage to run from back there? Can we run the, um, the spheres model, the surface model, and that, can we? Okay, right, we're going to just try and run, to finish, I'm stopping talking, uh, try and run uh, two of these things, two or three of these things live. Can we try the spheres one first? Um, yes, if you want. Mm -hmm. Well, how long does it take? Just a few minutes. Oh, no, no, no. Oh. That's good. <coughs> Not so much the big bangs, the big slip. I think while they're just fixing that, I, what I'm going to do, if you wouldn't mind, while I'm, oh, here we go. Okay. okay, so at the top you see the chromosome. You have environmental messages coming in and you have genetic messages coming in from all over the world. You can download this model to any machine. Anyone who's got the machine can download it and run their own set. So the self thing self-replicates. They have a, a complete self-replicating architectural generic model. On the bottom left, you see this, uh, the, the mapping of this, uh, the, the genetic search space. This is um, the simulation of the growth of one of these structures, which is, I think, the same one that's running in the exhibition space. So it's growing according to internal rules about the logic of the connection between the cells, transition rules, a three-dimensional cellular automata in close backing space, influenced by external information about the environment. We treat the environment and the structure as the same thing at the moment. Now the dross, um, in our own private little vocabulary, uh, if you think about this wool, actually what you can see and touch is what's left over after the cellular activity. You, the physicality of you, is the bit left over after the cellular activity and eating the beef burger. This is what's left over after that cellular activity. This is the, 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 the residual stuff, which we're decarapacing. Yes, thank you, Gordon. Gradually trying to, 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 to mutate. And yeah. Have we got one more? There's a question mark on this one. No. Yes? No. no. Okay, we haven't got one more. Right, we are going to see the last one. Okay, right. Okay, I just would like to end, and if I might, would you mind if I just read the, one, the last paragraph from the book again? Um, really to just try and summarize all this. I'm sorry to read it, but I, 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 it, it, it kind of condenses the whole thing into a few sentences. An evolutionary architecture will e exhibit metabolism. It will maintain stability with the environment by negative feedback and promote evolution by employing positive feedback. It will conserve information whilst using the processes of autopoiesis, autocatalysis, and emergent behavior to generate new forms and structures. Not a static picture, but a dynamic picture of becoming and unfolding, a direct analogy with the natural world. And the connection, of course, with what Gordon was saying. And also, Mark, I, I think um, that, the, that we, we, as a unit, maybe underplay the kind of uh, transmission of social information. And, that, and I particularly enjoyed Mark's talk on Tuesday and that contribution to uh, an understanding about other kinds of ways in which other sorts of information travel in these systems. 
Our architecture will derive order from its environment and be controlled by a symbiotic relationship with its inhabitants in that environment. It knows the coded instructions for its own development and is thus, in a limited sense, conscious of its actions and can thus be said to have some intelligence. All the parts of the model cooperate and in that sense it can be considered as an organism. But it will only fully exist as such if it is a member of an evolving system of organisms interacting with each other as well as with the environment. Our new architecture will emerge on the very edge of chaos where all living things emerge and it will inevitably share some characteristics of primitive life forms. And from this order, from this, <laughs> from this chaos, <laughs> will emerge order. From this chaos will emerge order. Order not particular, not peculiar, not odd or contrived, but order generic, typical, natural, fundamental, and inevitable, the order of life. I will take questions tonight, yes. We have to clear. Gordon. I repeat very clearly my own view on this, which is that we are too dependent upon derived science from other areas, and we are not sufficiently confident to say that we have things to say about these generative processes, which because of our unique position of not having to get worried about all the, all the, all the scientific facts, we can speculate from our own experience, right from inside ourselves, and say we know about how these things occur, and that in itself is, also, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a, a science. And I think we are, we, we under, underrate our, our ability to contribute something. I would also like to say that we've had a very distinguished set of visitors in this, and what all of them say is how much they enjoyed this audience, and the questions they got, and the questions they got at the bar, and the conversations at the restaurant afterwards, and so on. They are very happy to come into this environment to exchange ideas amongst each other, which they probably can't do anywhere else. I would like to promote the notion of the AA as a forum for discussing ideas that are particularly to do with these issues. And, and the idea of generative systems is one particularly obvious one. Creative systems is another. Information transfer in societies. And I mean, one could have a whole galaxy of, situ of, of suggestions. And I think the AA actually underrates, actually the AA probably doesn't do it, but architecture as a discipline, I think, underrates its ability to make serious contribution in all these uh, disciplines. The point I'd like to make about that is that although there are some books on architectural theory that mention the existence of these groups, I'm not aware of any book that uh, actually illustrates any of them. Uh, Lionel March, is what, there's another associated book from Cambridge which uh, shows some, some kind of crystallographic type diagrams, which is the closest I've come across. But the cultural overtone is this is all important. If you look at those plain symmetry groups that are illustrated with the Escher, it is fascinating. Um, Owen Jones's book, which um, uh, which is the book from which uh, Frank Lloyd Wright traced all the um, uh, drawings he took to um, uh, Sullivan's office in order to get his first job. Uh, 
<laughs> that book is full of extraordinary rich and e e examples of these symmetry groups. Now, there are 17 known plane symmetry groups, and every known civilization found all 17, yet nevertheless, they have individual characteristics of that, com that, 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 character, uh, that culture. There is no way you would confuse, shall we say, one of these symmetry groups turning up in an Islamic culture with one turning up in a Central European culture. But they enjoy and in in entail the same mathematical symmetry operations. Yet at the same time, they have their unique individual local characteristics. This idea is very important to me. If there's any student in the room who's looking for a topic for a general study essay, the thing we think we would love to know about is would somebody like to look at examples of cross-cultural referencing in three-dimensional symmetry groups? Because the examples of things from there, things like the Alhambra Palace and so are exquisite um, and totally under-researched. Gordon, that's going to be. I, yes, I mean, I think, um, I, I think, I think we've done ourselves a disservice by not paying more attention to this in the way in which the unit so far projected its work. But I, just for the, for, the, for the record, the current unit, who I'm very excited about the kind of ideas they're coming up with, them, are moving this much more into the idea at the moment, the realm of physical materialization of these. I didn't materialization in the, in the visualization, so materialization in the physicality. Of it. And one of the things that we've got to be very careful to pay a lot of attention to in that is this uh, um, uh, point that Gordon's just making, which we've, which we've been aware of, but I've really not done enough with. I think that's just to do with, at times, in order to make it possible to explain what they're doing, we've, I, I'm certainly guilty of over-exaggerating one particular thing at one moment in order to focus this up sharply. The diversity of students I've got actually makes that a nonsense right from the start. There's a diversity of, of, of views and opinions come in. And the way the unit operates, it does not have a clear goal at all. We've got a kind of, it's dead reckoning. We have a kind of rough wake behind us. We think we're going roughly in some direction, but everybody is free to go alongside where they want. And, 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 I, and I love the maximum conceivable diversity of approach and opinion. Every bit of that. And some of the most unpromising, unlikely things have turned out to be just pure gold. It's very difficult to tell in advance whether an idea, you have a hunch sometimes. And sometimes the hunch is right. Every so often you, you get it wrong. How do you know? And, and that's a problem like grants in science. It's hopeless because they get that they, they, they apply for grants on the basis of somebody's expectation they can do it. In order to do that, they have to describe a doable problem with a doable methodology. But if you could do that, then it's already you've already done it. So that, you know, sorry. Just, uh, it's quite a That, that's, a, that's a very beautiful point. So if you don't, this is George Mallon, if you don't. That's really, no, it's a very elegant point. Um, what I was trying to say in that, that, that outburst was rude to say, uh, everyone is, they can do what they like, 
everyone's free agent. But I do wish they would be clear what it is they're doing. It's when, you know, so if there's somebody up there, at least I'm trying to be clear about it, and I hope whoever's up there who's got a broader view than me, at least think, well, you know, you know, poor little chap, he's struggling around there, but at least it's clear in his own sense. It's this um, borrowing and stealing and transferring of ideas as if they contain a lot more than they do when it's not really there. That is what it, I don't, anyone can do what they like with everything. That's a free world. But I do wish people would be clear at what level they're operating, whether it's literal, whether it's a metaphor, whether it's analogy, whether it's inspiration, and try to be specific about that. That's all I ask. Otherwise, it devalues an intellectual currency. No, I understand that. I, I, I think and I entirely take the point there's probably somebody else who could do the same game on no, me, I'm and that's fine. Point. And, and, and if you know who they are, could we invite them to lecture? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to get at the idea of abstraction as such and, and, and building science, not necessarily. Yeah. Yes. It's I necessarily guess. concerned with the visible world, <coughs> but with the world mm. of ideas, which have their own replicatory process. And they need the architecture to connect mm. to that in the same way as molecules and DNA are connected to it. But it's not mm. ultimately about the No. Uh, the, the differences yeah. are so, yeah. so yeah. fundamental. Yeah. And then uh, when we see these quite beautiful developments mm. of form which we mm. have through the computer, I think we should again uh, have a, another warning note. What we see is what we know. We are creating images which we have seen, for example, in futurism or in, in, mm. in, in models, mm. mathematical models a hundred mm. years ago or more. And so generating forms through the computer which are in fact not as revolutionary not as complex as we would like perhaps to think so on these two planes mm. I suggest we should play, uh, we should have considerable caution and reflect again and again yes, I, 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 I take that criticism very much to heart first of all there was an element of self mockery and the showing of the Disney um, Sorcerer's Apprentice at the beginning um, Oh, and also in passing, isn't it wonderful how good, how good animation was before they used computers to do it? <laughs> uh, the, the, uh, so there was, there was an element of self-criticism implied in that, that, that you know, that, that one can get carried away with, you know, that one actually doesn't know what one's doing. There is another level to this, which is that um, um, the... Even, even the most hard-nosed sort of Darwinians, like R R Dawkins, they, they, they mark all the things that um, Shell wrote to talk about last night, like the, the, the elan, uh, vitalism, uh, the entelechy, the idea that, that you have to have some will to life and all that. Uh, they mock all that. But then, when they actually write, nevertheless, they inadvertently, I mean, D Dawkins, one of his best-known books, or his first book, was called The Selfish Gene. Now, in order to talk about selfish gene, you're immediately imbuing this gene with anthropomorphic um, symbolism. I mean, how could a gene be selfish? This is a, this is a, this is a human concept. I mean, this, is a, this is a concept we've brought in and applied. So they're subject to the same kind of criticism. Uh, I, I am sensitive to this, uh, th this issue. And uh, I think that uh, it's very nice to hear someone publicly voice these concerns. And uh, we uh, perhaps... Perhaps in an attempt to try to be clear and enthusiastic about what we're doing, um, not necessarily always sufficiently dwell on some of the, the negative side and the problems. And, I, and I, I, I do entirely understand that to talk of nature as a computer, any reductionist position, basically the very word, you know, why, why reduce ourselves to, 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 to mere... It doesn't tell you anything. Um, I, I'd agree, actually.
Yes. That's right. But the delightful bit, the lovely bit of the whole thing was that the ENIAC, the world's, actually was finished too late. It was supposed to compute the trajectory of shells, and it was actually finished too late with the slightest bit of use in the war, which is um, the bit that Americans never tell you. I think there's a couple more questions here. If you could take those two, and maybe that's it. There's a gentleman in the striped shirt. Right, well, there are two stages to answer that question. The first one was that if you take the simpler version of our model, where we're trying to um, encapsulate people's gene generic ideas, the generating first initial spark in the thing, that's very simple. That is, you basically try and capture that extraordinary essence. It's the essence by which you can tell every individual architect's work as being their own, every individual ality, that you can capture that. And in the exhibition, you can see that in the, in the Walter Siegel model and the Cedric Price model. They're very limited models, and indeed my own retro three models in there, where that's clearly visible, that the, the whole of their kind of thinking is encapsulated in some way in the working of the process, and therefore they are, in that sense, immortal, because they can, this is going on indefinitely. The other twist to this was towards the end when I said, ah, but nevertheless, <laughs> I think we can dispense with that too. Now, this is the more problematic point. It's probably the one that's giving you the, the, the problem. Uh, that is to say that, that one takes even a step further back and says that the creative bit is setting up the situation in which something could happen. Now, you might say, well, that's not uh, colored by anyone's individuality or anything else. Uh, to which I have two answers. One is, well, it would probably be better if it wasn't. That is, uh, but Mr. Fuller had a nice ha 
were, which a phrase which was that the house should be muted like a violin at zero. A violin doesn't make any noise till you play it. Why should a building live in until you do something with it? That's one argument. The other argument is to say that nevertheless it's actually impossible to in any way repress people's individuality. It comes through so strongly. Another example of that is the way in the, which in the most technical kind of work, nevertheless, you can see immediately which student and which kind of ideas contributed to it. So I think that these things are impossible to lose uh, on the one hand, on the other Part of it is, is the, uh, there is a certain argument which suggests it might be a good thing if we could and change the balance in favour of the users and participation in the process. And conscious of the time that we need the lecture, there's one more speak, some of the back. Do you one, still want to? One the back. Just can you make a very prosaic point in terms of what you said about colours and figures that when Prisci did his chemical experiments in the Japanese Institute, he showed that the rust effect was less than the colour effect. They were essentially using chemical reactions as three dimensions of massive power. I think we should thank the audience for being so patient for three and a half weeks. Okay, well, first of all, I would like to thank the audience. Uh, but mostly, I'd like to thank uh, John for this talk, uh, for the series of talks, and to congratulate him and Julia on the exhibition. Thank you very much.